be the Holy One among you, so I will not come in fury. They will go after Adonai, who will roar like a lion, for he will roar, and the children will come trembling from the west. They will tremble like a bird as they come from Egypt, like a dove as they come from the land of Ashur, and I will resettle them in their houses, says Adonai. Alvino McCain, our Father, our King Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that your word is true and everything you say has and will come to pass, Father. Father, we ask you to give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive your word, Father. And I just praise you and thank you for it, Father. In Yeshua's name, amen. You can read the intro here. Having described the severity of the punishment about to befall the nation of Israel, regarding, now again, this is, this is uh, talking to the northern tribes right, right now, the Almighty now sends his prophet to claim the reason for this harsh treatment. Because I singled them out for special attention and love from the outset of their very existence. I therefore deal with them more strictly than I do with other nations. Since I have designated them as my children, it is incumbent upon me to reprimand and even punish them as a father does his offspring. Accordingly now, they will have constantly sinned against me, and they have no cause for complaint when I punish them. So verse 11, 1, I'm just going to read some commentary from the ESV study Bible, but I'm actually going to focus on verses 8 and 10 and 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called him. Now here, this is a dual um, word, because number one, it refers to, uh, again, God delivering Israel out of Egypt, but it also refers to Messiah. It's also a messianic uh, prophecy as well. Here's one of the most endearing passages in Hosea. The prophet uses family metaphor, betraying the, be, portraying the Lord not only as a husband, but also a father. This metaphor was not original to Hosea. Uses, uses the line, out of Egypt, I called my son. We see that and we're going to look at um, Exodus 4:22 and 23 and Matthew 2:15 to show that Yeshua is the Son of God, i.e. the heir of David, who embodies Israel's relationship to God. So uh, let's just look at um, Exodus 4, 22 and 23, again referring to uh, the scripture. Exodus 4, 22 and 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And then I'll go to Matthew 2.15. Matthew 2.15. Matthew 2.15. Matthew 2.15. So here we see this verse is referring back, but also referring forward. Actually, past, present, and future. He, re, um, he remained there until the death of Herod. Let's begin to verse 13. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of Yahweh appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Yosef got up and took the child and his mother while it was night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by Yahweh through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. So here they're uh, confirming that this is a prophetic verse, not only looking back, but also looking forward to Messiah. Israel labeled is labeled God's son, again in Exodus 4.22. Um, again, came out of Egypt in the Exodus, the movement of Israel prefigures the movement of Messiah, who is the faithful son, whereas Israel, as son, repeatedly failed. So here, Israel, um, time and time again, you know, was an unfaithful son, but Messiah proved himself to be a faithful son. Hallelujah. Thank Yahweh for that. Amen. Verses 2 and 4, the Lord loved Israel from the beginning and never stopped loving them. As I was studying this, and especially when I came upon uh, the verses 10 and 11, I just felt 
God's love and mercy for Israel just oozing out of the pages yeah. here. Throughout their history, he taught Ephraim, that is Israel, to walk and heal them, as a father does with his child. Some commentators think the image of a parent and a child continues in verse 4, and led them with cords of kindness and with bands of love. The meaning would be light bands or cords with which a parent supports and guides a toddler who is learning to walk. But most commentators think that in verse 4 the image changes to that of a farmer with his animals who removes the yoke and leads the animal not with harsh ropes and a yoke but with light cords and bands to guide the animal to their food. Then the Lord, like a gentle farmer, even bent down and fed them. Verse 4, In all of the manifestation of grace, the Lord was not initiating a new basis for a relationship between him and his people, for the relationship from the beginning was never based on law but on redemptive grace. Again, it was, it was based on his love and his mercy that he chose Israel. Among other places, this is illustrated by the preamble of the Ten Commandments. I am Yahweh your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It was God's love that provided and still provides the underpinning for all ultimate relationship of care, guidance, and obedience. Tragically, however, more than anything else, it was Yahweh's love that was spurned. The more they were called, the more they went away, and my people are bent on turning away from me. Again, going back to the beginning of Hosea, he gave that example of Hosea marrying an unfaithful wife and the love that he had you know, for her. Verses 5 to 7, they shall not return, in other words, they're not going to return back to Egypt, but Assyria. Some read not or is surely, um, seem to contradict reading a negative here. This is grammatically possible, but not necessary. Egypt, to those earlier verses, may be a name representing of all foreign powers, whereas here Hosea says they will not literally return to Egypt, because again, they were going to look to Egypt to help them. Okay? This verse may mean the hope of finding deliverance from Egypt will fail. The Israelites will find themselves subject to a new Pharaoh, not in Egypt, but in Assyria. Verse 8. Now here, again, I'm, this is where I'm going to really focus, because as I, you know, as I read these chapters, and, you know, sometimes I'll read it through once, and I'm thinking, well, Father, what do you want, you know, me, to me to focus on? And as I'm reading, just certain verses just jump out to me. And verse 8 and 10 to 11 were just, are just really, you know, again, I just, I just felt, you know, not only God's love for Israel, but the love for his people, Amen. period, Amen. all his people, all his children. How many times we were unfaithful, but he is always faithful, and he is always loving us. Here he says, how can I give you up? In highly anthropomorphic terms, the Lord pours out his irrepressible love and expresses the same sentiment. The relationship between God and His chosen must not be viewed as a formality. These emotional outpourings demonstrate that the Lord is a person filled with compassion unlike the lifeless Baals. His affection weighs heavier than Israel's ingratitude and He cannot bring Himself to announce His people, to renounce His people, even though they renounce Him. How can I make you like Adma and like Zeboim? These two, two cities were totally destroyed, uh, the same as Sodom and Gomorrah. Also, the love that the Lord has for his children restrains him from obliterating them. He will preserve Israel through a remnant. Now let's look at, um, let's want to look at Romans 11. Again, you can look at, I'm going to go over some other scriptures. But God always has a remnant. Hallelujah. Let's begin with uh, 11, verse 1. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I am too an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham and the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and, are, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not 
bow the knee to Baal. So again, just as there is a remnant within Israel, there's also a remnant among those who call themselves Christians, but there are true believers, and then there are those that are just by name. Okay? And God knows who that remnant is. Those that are obedient to his word. Hallelujah. And that love him. In the same way, then, there has come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace and is no longer in the basis of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. Again, you see it as we're studying the prophets in Hosea, how God has warned them. He's trying to deal with their hearts, but their hearts have become hardened. They don't want to listen. They don't want to believe that God's going to punish them. You know, they think that, you know, hey, everything's just going to be hunky-dory because, hey, we're Israel. We're his chosen, you know. It's yeah. like, I think that's sometimes how we think. Well, God's going to, you know, bless us. God's going to bless America. After all, we are founded on, you know, Judeo-Christian, you know, principles. But it's like, are we living it? That's right. Hallelujah. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not, and bend their backs forever. Again, I see this in a lot of, you know, um, again, I believe that there's the true church of Messiah, and then there's the false one. And the, the false one, they're, just, they're not seeing what God's doing. They're not hearing what God is saying. They don't want to. They want to, uh, you know, uh, mold the word the way they want to. They want to conform the word according to their sin and how they want to, to walk. And then there's the true believers who have set themselves apart and say, No, Father, I am going to, I am going to serve you. I am going to do what your word says to do because I love you, but more so because you love me. Amen. Amen. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles or the nations to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? For I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch that I am apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is a reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Again, we're living in a time where we're seeing more and more Jewish people come to faith in Messiah. And even those who haven't come to faith in Messiah, those of us that are, you know, uh, maybe of Jewish background or, you know, from the nations or, you know, uh, wherever we're from, returning to Torah and they're paying it they're looking that they're seeing that and they're they're realizing that wait something's going on here you know they're seeing you know people returning that's what's going to provoke them to jealousy not just us returning to Torah but seeing the miraculous among us as well and the signs and wonders and our love for Israel and are staying with them and not compromising the word and not telling them the Torah has been done away with and you don't have to keep the feast and you don't have to keep Shabbat. You know, but having people tell them, hey, you know, we, it's this. I told this one Jewish man who was uh, visiting here ministering from Israel and I says, it's Yeshua that brought us back to Torah. And he looked at me and says, you know, a lot of people have been telling me that. You know, because I want them to know that, you know, again, we don't deny Messiah because we're afraid to offend our Jewish brothers. We need to be bold for Messiah, but love them as well and tell them the reason, hey, the reason we're walking in Torah because our Messiah walked in Torah. Because he told us to obey his commandments because he loved God, he loved the Torah, and he did the Torah. Hallelujah. So let's go back now. So God always has a righteous remnant. So Trey Hassar's commentary, again, I'm going to read these verses again. How can I give you up? This is from the Tree of Life version. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I surrender you, Israel? How can I make you let Adma? And how can I set you as Zeboim? My heart is turning over within me. My compassions are kindled. Again, I just felt God's love and mercy and grace crying out to them. But you know, God cannot condone sin. No. He cannot turn his back on sin. 
He's, you know, and he gave them, again, this just, again, didn't happen overnight. He gave them years and years to repent and to come back to them. You know, praise God for his grace. He's had grace on this country. Again, you know, and I believe that God's not finished with this country. I believe there's a remnant that he's going to use, and I want him to use us to stir up this land, to stir up and, and see people return Amen. to God yes. and the truth of God. He says, I will not vent my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God, not a man, the Holy One in the midst of you, and I will not come in fury. Despite your, uh, this is a, the Treasar commentary. Despite your lack of appreciation for the special treatment I have accorded you, and in spite of your constant rebelliousness and infidelity to me, I will nevertheless withhold the full force of the retribution you have earned as my great love for you prevents me from carrying out. In other words, God did not totally destroy Ephraim. Some returned back to the tribes, but the others were dispersed. They were among the nations. Okay, but they, that, again, that DNA is still out there, and we're going to look at some things towards the end. To totally destroy them would have, would have meant that they, you know, there would not have been uh, any you know, um, descendants from them. They would have been totally obliterated. Right. How can I give you over Ephraim or deliver you Israel? How can I render you like Adma or like Zeboim? My heart has been turned over. My mercies have been kindled. How can I possibly give you over to the enemy Ephraim? How can I deliver you, the remaining tribes of Israel, to the oppressor? Although you were deserved the same fate as met the cities of Adam and Zeboim, which were overturned and destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah, I find myself unable to carry out such a decree, for my heart has been turned over and my decision rescinded. Due to my great love for the Jewish nation Israel and my mercies, for you have been, kind for I have been kindled and set aflame. Again, Hosea is mainly the prophet to the northern tribes. Okay, uh, Judah, uh, there are other um, prophets prophesied to Judah, but Judah didn't totally forsake God. He, they still had some righteous kings and leaders among them. But the, the ten tribes were, you know, totally went over to, to paganism. Now here is God's love for them. Remember where I brought you from. Remember where I took you and delivered you. I chose you as my own. Again, God is a covenant-keeping God, and through his covenant with Abraham, and continued in Isaac and Jacob, God chose Israel and set them apart for himself. Why? Because through that line, through the line of Judah, would come Messiah. And that's why the enemy, uh, again, the enemy comes and he, bring, he, he tempts people with, uh, again, the biggest thing he tempted them with, because the big thing in paganism was sexual sin, because that was part of their worship. Part of their worship was prostitution. So let's look at these scriptures. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32, 36. Again, regarding God's great mercy and love for Israel. Again, uh, for natural Israel and also for, you know, his people in Messiah, the love that God has for us and the patience and mercy he has for us. You know, I look at back and how many times that, you know, that I blew it and I didn't, you know, uh, do what I was supposed to do or I made excuses and, and how God forgave me and gave me another chance. For the Lord will vindicate his people. He will have compassion on his servants. When he sees that their strength is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free. Again, we see God's compassion. You know, his, it says that, I think in the Psalms, that his compassions are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Let's look at 2 Samuel 24. Verses 15 to 17. <clears throat> so here God has to judge Israel because, um, again, if you go in verse 1, it says, Now again the anger of Yahweh burned against Israel, and it incited David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. So it was because of disobedience that this judgment came. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and 70,000 men 
of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. When the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who destroyed the people, It is enough. Now relax your hand. And the angel of Adonai was by the threshing floor of Aronah, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking down the people and said, Behold, it is I who have sinned, and it is I who have done wrong. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my fathers. So again, you know, David was taking the blame, but here we see God still, you know, taking his hand off and, and having compassion upon Israel. You know, people who don't know Torah and don't study the prophets, they think, well, see how harsh God is, you know, and how, you know, how cruel his judgment is, and aren't you glad that we didn't live in that day? And he said, God doesn't do anything without pre-warning them. If you obey me, you'll be blessed. If you don't, God cannot condone sin. God had to keep, keep Israel holy and set apart to him. But his grace and mercy was always at work. You know, whenever you know, I hear some of these ministers you know, teach on the Torah, they always look at the negative. They never look at the blessings. They never, you know, the, how God blessed Israel, gave them houses they didn't build, gave them lands that they didn't sow, and blessed them. They always look at the, the, the negative and the judgment. Well, the judgment came because of disobedience. And God always warned them. That's why we have the prophets, you know. Repent, turn back. I don't want to do this. I don't want to bring this judgment. Let's go to 2 Kings 13, 23. But the Lord, or Yahweh, was gracious to them, and he had compassion on them, and turned to them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them or cast them from his presence until now. And here this was, uh, again, speaking after the death of Elijah. But here we see God being gracious and having companion. God has always been a God of grace and mercy. You know, some people will teach, oh, well, you know, there's no grace and mercy in the Tanakh. There's only grace and mercy in the New Testament. It's like not. I go read from the very beginning, Genesis 3.15. God said, I'm going to provide a redeemer. I, he covered Adam and Eve. He shed the blood of an animal to um, cover them in their rebellion. Psalm 106.45. And number two, he is God. We're not. We are supposed to submit to him and love him. And, you know, and, and again, he has no, he says, you know, he has, he says, I have no joy in the death of my people. I have no joy in death over anybody. But the wages of sin is death. And we're talking about spiritual death. Psalm 106.45. Let's begin 44. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry, and he remembered his covenant for their sake, and relented according to the greatness of his loving kindness. What remembered his covenant with Abraham. All the way back to Abraham. God is a covenant-keeping God. Even though uh, Israel time and time broke the covenant, God never did. He never broke the covenant. Jeremiah 3, 12 to 14. And the greatest love and mercy he showed was sending Yeshua to take our place, to Amen. take our death penalty. Hallelujah. 3, 12 to 14. Let's begin verse 11. And Yahweh said to me, Faithless Israel has proved yourself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry. Only acknowledge your iniquity. That's all they had to do was repent and acknowledge their iniquity, yet their hearts was hardened. 
that you have transgressed against the Lord your God, or Yahweh Elohim, and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, declares Yahweh. Return, O faithless sons, declares Yahweh, for I am a master to you, and I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Sion. So here, I mean, you look all through as you study, all through. Uh, again, the prophets who are always refer back to Egypt because of that great deliverance. You know, and again, we, you know, he took, as we're coming upon Passover, you know, we look back as God delivering us from our Egypt. And we look back as it was us that was there as well, because we were. Mm -hmm. Everybody was there in that Passover. But some, you know, but you, he doesn't pass over until the blood is applied. Because remember he told Israel, you know, you have to apply the blood to the door. If there was no blood, the Israelites would have suffered the same fate as the Egyptians. They had to be obedient to God's instructions and cover their lentils with the blood. 11, 10 to 11. His children shall come trembling. I will return them to their homes, describes the return of a remnant of God's people from exile. Trehasar, the prophet, ends the chapter with a glimpse into the then distant future, depicting the final redemption, again looking to the end of days of the Jewish people and their permanent return to the Holy Land. Hosea 10 and 11, 10 and 11. They will walk after Adonai. He will roar like a lion. Hallelujah. The Lion of Judah. Indeed, he will roar and the children will come trembling from the west. Again, the west is, they went, you know, when you, were, when you head west from Israel, you are going away uh -huh. from Israel. Now he says they're returning from the west and coming back. They will come trembling like a bird out of Egypt, like a dove out of the land of Assyria, and I will settle them in their houses. It is a declaration of Adonai. This is Trehasar commentary. After Hashem they will follow, like a lion he shall roar, for he shall roar and the children shall stir from the west. I have responded to their iniquities with restraint. The magnitude of their sins nevertheless compels me to remove my divine presence from their midst and to banish them from their land. However, the day will yet arrive when they will seek out Hashem and follow after him while still in their exile. When that occurs, they will earn the right to follow him out of exile back to their homeland. For at that time the Almighty shall roar like a lion, who emits his mighty roar to gather together all the beasts of the jungle where he reigns supreme. So shall Hashem reveal himself to his people through a prophet or through a miraculous sign of his presence and to return to his holy land to experience once again his divine presence there like a son responding to his father's call to return home. Dependence on alliances, Ephraim has surrounded me with lies, but Judah still walks with God. Judah and the northern tribes, Ephraim, both suffered, suffered lapse in fidelity to Yahweh. But Judah, unlike Ephraim, had some good kings. Now, if you study the kings of Israel, Judah had some bad kings, but they had some righteous kings as well. Ephraim, all their kings were bad. None of them were fo followed the ways of God. One of the highest points in Judah's history was the victory over the Assyrians when Hezekiah was king. We see that in 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19, which was 20 years after Samaria fell, which was where the northern tribes were. Okay, Judah didn't go out to exile for another 20 years or more. Again, hoping they'd repent. Look what happened to the northern tribes because they didn't repent. But again, thinking, oh, this isn't going to happen to us. You know, and, and it's God's sending. And Jeremiah was one of the prophets to Judah. So let's look at some of these scriptures. Again, calling Israel back to the Father. Isaiah 2, 1 to 5. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Yehuda and Yerushalayim. Now it shall come about that in the last days, or end of days, the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains, 
and it will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of Elohim of Yaakov, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the Torah will go forth from Zion, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. So right there, that's a scripture that proves the Torah has not been done away with. That even the millennium, the nations are going to stream to Jerusalem to learn the Torah, learn his teachings and instructions. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. Again, this is rever referring to the millennial reign of Messiah. Come, house of Yaakov, and let us walk in the light of Yahweh. Let's go to Isaiah 11. I'm going to read actually all of Isaiah 11. Again, it's a very prophetic chapter. Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from its roots will bear fruit. The spirit of Yahweh will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Again, this is referring to Yeshua. This is a messianic verse. And he will delight in the fear of Yahweh. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision but what his, by what his ears say, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. For he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Again, this is a picture of Messiah Yeshua. Hallelujah. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little boy will lead them. Also the cow and bear will graze, and their young will lie down together. Again, this is referring to the millennium. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of a cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in any of my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Just as in the, in the garden, there were animals there, and there was no fear between animals and man. There was no... Um, again, viciousness, there was no attack, I mean, they walked, they were like pets, they were companions, you know, to Adam, and that's the way it's going to be in the millennium. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse and will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Then it will happen on that day that Yahweh will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain. From Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Again, Israel, this is referring to scattered Israel, has been scattered to all over the world. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Then the jealousy of Ephraim will depart and those who harass Judah will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, and Judah will not harass Ephraim. They will swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines on the west, and together they will plunder the sons of the east. They will possess Edom and Moab, and the sons of Ammon will be subject to them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt, and he will wave his hand over the river with his scorching wind, and he will strike it into seven streams and make men walk over dry shod. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left, just as there was for Israel in the day that they came out of the land of Egypt. Let's go to Isaiah 49.10. Again, speaking of future, they will not hunger or thirst, nor will the scorching heat or sun strike them down. For he who has compassion on them will lead them and will guide them to the springs of water. And then go to Jeremiah 31 9. With weeping they shall come, and by supplication I will lead them. 
I will make them walk by streams of waters on a straight path by which, by which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Let's look at um, John 8.12. And here Yeshua speak, and then Yeshua again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. Hallelujah. Go to Matthew 23, beginning with verse 37. Thirty-seven to thirty-nine. Here is Yeshua uh, weeping and crying over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left you desolate. For I say to you, for now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. So here we see the heart of Yeshua crying over Jerusalem. You know, again, there, but there was still a remnant of believers, and that remnant of believers in Yeshua's time included Pharisees and Sadducees as well. There were believing priests. You know, you see that, you see that in the book of Acts. It talks about that many priests followed after him. But here as a nation, um, they rejected him because it wasn't the king they were looking for. It wasn't the Messiah they were looking for. They were looking for a warrior Messiah who was going to get the Romans off their back. But what good is a temporary Messiah? Because you know what? If it was just yeah, Bar, you know, Bar Koba, they had other you know, uh, men rise up who claimed to be Messiah after Yeshua and they were killed. Right. You know, what, they had, what God had to deal with first was the spiritual. And he will return as the king of kings the line of Judah, the Lord of Lord. And he will restore Israel to the entire land that he has promised them. And he will rule and reign. Some say that, that David will actually rule in, um, in physical Jerusalem and Yeshua will, re will rule from heavenly Jerusalem together. But he, Yeshua will be ruling over the whole world. You know, and I get goosebumps and I just felt that. Wow, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise you, Yeshua. And God, you know, again, Yeshua's love you know, for his people is, you know, again, we need to have that same love. That you can hear the Father's heart crying out, the same as in the Hosea, you know, I don't want to destroy you. I don't. Again, God had mercy by sending them out because he could have totally destroyed their bloodline right. and ended them, <clears throat> but he didn't. He had mercy. Some, again, some did return and, and submitted to the leadership of Judah because that's the whole reason for the split because the northern tribes didn't want, did not want to submit to Judah's leadership, even though God says Judah's the one who has a scepter. They're the ones that I chose to be the leaders. But they wanted to do their own thing, their own way of worship. And God says, you have to return. But when you return, you have to return in submission. You have to return in repentance. And some of them did and submitted to, to Judah's leadership, but others chose to assimilate into uh, the countries where they just you know, eventually uh, went to. But even the rabbis say that even though um, these, quote, lost tribes went into these countries, they brought some, the knowledge of God that they had with them into these lands, even though it ended up getting mixed with, you know, yeah. paganism. The sages always try to look at the past. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're going to look back, and what caught my eye is, okay, what are these islands of the sea? So we're going to look back a little bit to see what some, you know, what are they, what are they talking about? So beginning with Genesis 10.1, again, as I'm studying, when I see something, I'm like, you know, islands of the seas, Father, what is that? You know, it's good as you're, as you're studying the scripture, you know, it's good to have questions. You know, Father, what is that? I don't understand that. So uh, again, we look at Genesis 10:1, and these are this is the genealogy records of Noah's sons: Shem, which we know is the righteous remnant. The righteous remnant came through Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. Now here, it's verse two, it's, it's, it's zeroing in on Japheth's sons were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. Gomer's sons were Ashkenaz, Riphath. 
Togarma, Javan sons were Elisha and Tarshish, Kittites and, and Dodanites. From these the coastlands of the nations spread out in their lands. Here one according to his language, according to their families, and to their nations. Ham's sons were Cush, Mitzrium, Put, and Canaan. Cush's sons were Seba, Havilah, Zapta, Ramah, and Zepka, and Ramah's sons were Sheba and Dedan. You know, a lot of times we like to pass over this stuff, but it's important <laughs> to understand to understand this background. Ancestry of the people of the coastlands. Genesis 10 describes the three sons of Noah and some of their sons and grandsons from which the Bible says all peoples of all nations physically now on earth are descended. So again, we all descend from, from the loins of Noah who descended from the loins of you know those who, uh, Adam, going back to Adam. So Genesis 10 again describes the three sons of Noah and some of their sons and grandsons from which the Bible says all people of all nations physically now on earth are descended. Although quite a few specific nations are mentioned, not all the nations or grandsons of Noah are probably mentioned, such as those included under the islands of the sea. In Hebrew, the original land of the... T the, the in ugh. Okay, in Hebrew, the original language of the Tanakh, I tend to read faster than I talk, including Genesis, the word for islands, can also be translated as coastland. Remember, after the flood, the, uh, the borders of nations changed. You know, you can take the nations and push them together and see how they all fit together, but after the flood, things were spread out and, and you know, broken up. So here, specifically, the entry in Strong's exhaustive concordance, Hebrew-English dictionary, is as follows, i.e., a habitable spot as desirable, dry land, a coast, an island, country, isle, or coast. This probably includes China, Japan, Korea, and Southeast Asia, and the rest of their Far East, India, and the Indian subcontinent, Siberia, and the Americas, and the Ocean, and other islands. So in other words, all these continents are surrounded by water. Okay, they all have coasts. The general term islands of the sea in reference to Israel also means that these are places and people that are far from Israel and not mentioned specifically in the other sons or grandsons of Noah. Again, God mentions those that were important and would play a part, but you know, there was probably it could have been, you know, different people. How many people are discovered in some of these islands that nobody ever heard of? You know, missionaries, they go to these and they find these primitive people that, you know, are just totally, you know, a, a nation to themselves. Um, <clears throat> Some of the corresponding nations or peoples given in the following paragraph are from the book After the Flood, the early post-flood history of Europe, traced back to Noah by Bill Cooper, New Wine Press. Again, this is just from research I did. The scripture references from Genesis 10 of the ancestry of the places and the peoples and the islands of the Sea of Japheth is as follows. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them sons were born after the flood. So here, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, they said, were whales and the Germanic people. Magog and Medea, the Medes or Iran. Now Magog you hear a lot mentioned in in scripture, and that's modern day Iran, and Javan, Greece, and Tubal, regions around current Toblisk, Russia, and Tbilisi, and Georgia, Meshek, region around Moscow and Russia, Tyrus, a region around Tirana, Albania, and the Balkans. Again, all these places have a, have a key in the end of days. And the sons of Gomer, the Ashkenaz, or Germanic people, Again, you find you found a lot of Jewish people migrated to Germany, and that's where you get the Ashkenazi Jews. Okay, and Rifath and Torga or Turkey. Actually, it's part of my DNA is from Turkey. And the sons of Javan, Elisha, that gives the expression Hellenic with respect to Greece, and probably gives rise to the expression of the Elysian fields and Tarshish. Now we've heard of Tarshish, which is southern Spain and Portugal from the announcement some time ago on the BBC of archaeological remains. Again, they found uh, remains uh, showing that this area was probably part of uh, Spain. 
But these were the isles or coastlands of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, and to their nations. Now we see in chapter 11, then we get, um, we see Nimrod rising up, and we see that Babylonian spirit rising up. We're not going to get into that, though, because I don't know. Okay, Isaiah 11, uh, 10 and 11. God through the Messiah, Yeshua, will gather his earthly people, the Jews, from the islands of the sea. Again, from everywhere they've been scattered. From everywhere we've been scattered across, you know, God knows where they are. Amen. You know, he, you know, this one, when I remember when I was first saved and I was reading the book of Revelation, and I was seeing all the, you know, the tribes listed, and I said, well, Father, Judah knows who they are, but how do these others know who they are? But here we see God stirring up the DNA. We're seeing that they have found some of these, and I'm going to be showing you next, some of these lost tribes. And I personally believe, number one, we can't get caught up in, why well, I'm from this tribe or I'm from that tribe. You know, the fact is that we have been, you know, God has made a way for Israel to return through Messiah, and that's what's important. But I believe, you know, that the DNA within us, you know, whether it's, it's Jewish or from the northern tribes is what's stirring us, is what's drawing us back, that we have, there's a connection there within us. That's the sum of the nations, they, you know, and I, because I wonder, why doesn't everybody get this? Why don't they feel, you know, I mean, there's uh, those in the churches, they love Israel, but they don't, there's a different connection, I believe, by those who are messianic. There's, there's a connection um, a greater connection even. But again, we're connected through Messiah. And so Paul says, you know, start arguing like, you know, what lineage you're from. He says you're in Messiah. But again, this to me it's shown that God is doing exactly what his said his word is going to do. Yeah. Isaiah 11, 10 to 11. It will also come about in that day that the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will seek for him and his resting place will be glorious. It will also come about in that day that my Lord will again redeem a second time with his hand the remnant of his people who remain from Assyria, from Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. So again, they were dispersed. You know, a remnant has returned. We see God's because a remnant has returned to Israel. You know, and um, I believe that when Messiah returns, he is the one who's going to gather all of Israel back into the land. And then, you know, those of the nations, God will, you know, have, you know, um, they'll be part, you know, they're obviously part of his end time plan. But I believe it's when, you know, we're like a first fruits of it. But it's ultimately because, number one, the, the, the land that Israel has now will never fit all the Israelites. <laughs> you know, it's, it's but... Judah needs to be there first because Judah the ones that needs their place of uh, safety, you know, where they can be a Jew without being persecuted. You know, I believe that America was set apart, again, especially because America wasn't even heard of until, what, two, three hundred years ago, you know, except for the Native Americans <laughs> that lived here already. You know, but God set this part as, as, I believe, a holy place, a place of safety for his people. Unfortunately, we're going to see we're going to see some of the history of the early people that that came here and what they said. Again, the day in verse ten. This refers to the messianic age, especially the beginning of it, when there will, will arise a root out of Jesse. This refers to Messiah, Yeshua, who was a direct descendant of Jesse and who is the father of King David. We can as seen in Yeshua's genealogies. Uh, again, they always bring Yeshua's genealogies back to, you know, David. And this will refer to Yeshua as being a descendant of King David and a recipient of the Davidic throne and the right to rule Israel. And again, if you study in scriptures, and I got a picture at home, it shows heavenly Jerusalem and earthly Jerusalem. And um, the rabbis are very well aware of the heavenly Jerusalem as well as the earthly Jerusalem. Because the earthly Jerusalem is a picture of the heavenly Jerusalem. The earthly tabernacle was a picture of the heavenly tabernacle. And the Bible says that, that, that the Jerusalem will come down from heaven will actually hover over the earth in the, in, in the millennial age. Hallelujah. And we'll be able to go, like, kind of go back and forth. <laughs> Eyes have not seen or ears have heard the That's things right. that God has prepared for them. I mean, we can't even imagine 
That's why I love that song, I Can Only Imagine. It's oh. like, you know, we can't even begin to imagine, you know, what it's going to be like. Yeshua and the Messianic Kingdom will be, will be both an ensign or a flag to the Jews, and to his flag or symbol or his reign, the Gentiles or people of the nations will seek. Again, the Jewish people are noticing more and more people, Gentiles, are interested in learning Torah. And the Bible talks about that at the end of days, that ten of the nations will take hold of the Talit of a Jew and say, teach us your Torah, because we know God is with you. Right. And we see that happening. It also, says, uh, it also says Yeshua's rest when he will have overcome all the ungodly, demonic, and human foes and cause a time of glory, the glory of God through Yeshua, Yeshua fully expressing his grace, righteousness, and peace justice and prosperity again this is during the millennial reign there will be satan will be bound and you know the, there'll be a thousand years of of peace and and shalom hallelujah at the beginning of this messianic age yeshua will reach out a second and final time to bring his chosen earthly people the jews from assyria a uh, region around northern iraq and southern turkey and Egypt, from Pathos, southern Egypt, from Kush, Ethiopia region, for Elam, Persia, Pakistan, and western India, from Shinar, southern Iraq, from Hamad, Lebanon, and Syria, and from the islands or coastlands, again, China, Japan, Korea, Siberia, India, the America. I mean, they were been spread all out, <laughs> hallelujah, but God knows where they are. He knows where we are, hallelujah, he knows our name. The first time God reached out to gather his people from the nations was after they returned to Israel following the evasion of the Assyrians of the northern kingdom of Israel. And then by the Babylonians of the southern kingdom, again, a, a remnant returned um, from the northern tribes. Because you see that in the New Testament, it mentions um, one of them was Anna, who was from the tribe of uh, Asher. So we know that there were some northern tribes during the time of Yeshua back in the land. And also the time of when... Uh, Judah was in Babylon, uh, again, uh, uh, God opened the doors for them to return to the land. We, only know, we know only a small percentage chose to return because Babylon was comfortable, you know. And, but we see God, again, calling them back. The gathering of the Jews a second time began in earnest when the nations of Israel was reestablished in 1948, but will be completed in the early part of the Messianic age. Again, it's a remnant that has returned, but you know, there's more Jews outside the land that still haven't come back. There's a lot of Jews in America, there's in Canada, and you know, in, in all over the world. But God has started a remnant to come back. The scripture, in fact, I think I was reading the rabbi said there are more Jews in, in Israel now than ever before. I think they said there's over six million, you know, Jews in Israel. So there's more than you know, any, bef any before. Um, the scripture reference in Isaiah 11 of Yeshua establishing his messianic kingdom, which we read, and calling out his chosen early people, the earthly people, the Jews, from the islands of the sea and other parts of the world. Now here's a map. This is from Jewish Voice. This is, shows the area of actual lost tribes that they have discovered in, di in different areas. And I'm going to read you uh, some of them. First, the Ethiopian Jews. For centuries, the Beta and the Ethiopian Jews are, were believed to be descendant of the Queen of Sheba and Solomon. For centuries, the Beta Israel of Gandur, the Beta Abraham of Addis Abba, and the Gafet of Oliso and Hosanna have endured persecution for their falasha or foreign status among Ethiopians. Many believe that from the, they are from the tribe of Dan. Thousands were rescued from poverty and brought to Israel during the massive airlifts of 84, 85, and 91. And there are some miraculous things that happened during these airlifts as well. The Aliyah, or Return of the Jews to Their Homeland program sponsored by Israel, has been stopped and resumed a number of times since then. Only those Jewish people who have not converted to another religion. In other words, there are Messianic Ethiopians, but they wouldn't take them because they considered them converting to another religion. Only those Jews people who have not converted to another religion and are concerted, considered by authorities to remain solely Jewish in their faith were permitted to make Aliyah. We know of many thousands of people who belong to small tribal groups and are continuing to reach out to them with the love of their Jewish Messiah. The Yibar of Somaliland the origin of the Yabar is unclear, it is one of the oldest ethnic groups in Somaliland, 
and it is said to predate Islam in that area. They are known as highly secretive of their language, not letting members or other ethnic groups around them even hear them speak it. Some suggest they came from Beta Israel of Ethiopia and are therefore also believed to be from the tribe of Dan. Having made their way into Somaliland, while it remains disputed and certain, the Yabar do not ha do have some things in common with Beta Israel, namely their outcast status in their countries and metalworking trades. They have not sought to make themselves known to Israel and Jewish officials because it would create more problems for the Yabar people who already endured a despised position among their countrymen. The Bene Menashe of India, when the Bene Menashe Jews of India were found, they called themselves Israelites rather than Jews and they claimed the tribe of Manasseh. After the Assyrian conquest, some of the, uh, Israel's people of the northern kingdom followed the Silk Route into China. The Silk Route was a 4,000 mile long road system developed from commerce between China and the Middle East. Again, they found some people in Chinese who claimed connection to the lost tribes from India who claimed question, and they've been making Aliyah back to Israel. So again, that's prophecy we're saying coming to pass. Uh, some believe that after settling in China, some Jewish people migrated south into the northern regions of India. Some of the Bene Menashe dispute this, saying they do not have the same customs as the Chinese. They remember their father sacrificing an animal, taking the blood and painting it onto doorposts at Passover. Again, not being taught this, it was just something that was passed on to them for thousands of years. Uh, the Igbo of Nigeria, the Igbo are said to have migrated from Syria, Portugal, and Libya into West Africa uh, after the Assyrian army deported them. They also believed themselves to be of the tribe of Dan. In the ninth century, a Jewish traveler came across the Igbo and wrote that they had the, same, that they had the entire body of Jewish scriptures except the book of Esther and Lamentations. Written, written records were lost during years of persecution in Muslim areas. However, they maintained many Jewish practices over the uh, centuries, including circumcision on the eighth day, observance of some of the dietary laws, laws of uncleanness and celebration of Jewish holidays, including Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, and Passover. The Lemba of Zimbabwe, the Lemba are also believed to have fled Jerusalem after the temple was destroyed around 586 BC. Though not among the traditional described ten lost tribes of Israel, these Jewish people were scattered when the southern kingdom of, of Judah fell to Babylon. It is believed they fled Judea and ended up in Yemen. From Yemen they migrated to Africa, eventually settling in Ethiopia and Tanzania. Many left Ethiopia and moved south to Zimbabwe and became known as the Lemba. Seventy percent of the Lemba have, te have tested to possess Kohanim DNA, lending credibility to their claim of ties to the ancient people of Israel, particularly the Levites. Again, here we see, God knows where they are. Hallelujah. <laughs> lost, and, lost and found to us. The history of the Lost Tribes is fascinating, and we rejoice in being a part of reaching again and gathering uh, Jewish voices a lot to reach out to these people. Again, these scattered people to Israel, more important, bring it back to God through Yeshua. We've seen firsthand that God is reconciling them to himself in extraordinary numbers. So again, another proof that we are living in the end of days. Amen. Hallelujah. The Puritans of America, early settlers, are more Jewish than Protestants. The Puritans were obsessed with the Bible and came to identify their political struggles against England with that of the ancient Hebrews against Pharaoh or the king of Babylon. And when I was studying this, I thought, what, maybe it was something in their DNA that was connected to Israel, that they felt, they felt connected to Israel. Okay? Because they identified so strongly with ancient Israel, they chose to identify with the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. In 1620, the separatists sailed for America on the Mayflower. The separatists or Puritans who settled at Plymouth Colony called themselves pilgrims because of their wanderings in search of religious freedom. The Puritan culture of New England was marked from the outset by a deep association with Jewish themes. Um, 
know the Christian community in history, no Christian community in history identified more with the Israelites of the Bible than did the first generation of settlers of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, who believed their own lives to be a literal reenactment of the biblical drama of the chosen people. They were the children of Israel, and the ordinance of God's holy covenant by which they lived were his divine law. Since they viewed themselves as the persecuted victims of the sin of uh, the Messiah, I'm sorry, my, some typos there, of the Messiah of the, let me go back. <laughs> Since they viewed themselves as the persecuted victims of the Christian establishment, that's what it's supposed to be, uh, of the old world, the Puritans also had a natural sympathy for the Jews of their own time. The Protestant Puritan leader, Cotton Mather, repeatedly referred to the Jews in his prayer for their conversion as God's beloved people. The new Israel, the influence of the Hebrew Bible, marks every step of the Puritan exodus to, to their Zion in the wilderness of the New World. The Jewish people, uh, the Jewish Bible formed their minds and dominated their characters. Its competitions were its conceptions were their conceptions. The next major group of, uh, we're getting to the end, so hang in there. The next Puritan group of Puritan settlers to arrive in New England was headed by John Winthrop and founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They were ruled, they were ruled initially by an elite leading Puritan family since the colony itself was based on biblical principles and was moved by the Puritan spirit of the scriptures was the Holy Jewish Bible. The Puritans wholeheartedly believed that it was their special mission to establish in America a society precisely modeled on the precept of sacred Jewish scriptures. Here we see the foundation of America was, was supposed to be based on the Jewish scriptures. And of course, that includes the New Testament, which is Jewish scriptures. The Puritans wholeheartedly believed that it was their special mission to establish in America a society precisely modeled on the precepts, again, of Jewish scripture. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was at the very least a state inspired by and thoroughly devoted to the Jewish people. If we keep this covenant, Governor John Withrop assured his people, we will find that God of Israel is among us, but if we deal falsely with our God, we will be consumed out of the good land whither we are going. So they knew that their blessings depended on obedience mm -hmm. to God's word. And now you look at that whole East Coast now, it is, most, it is the most liberal area in the country. And here yet, its roots were founded on godly principles and the Bible. The Jewish covenant concept was thus the bedrock of all Puritan religious communities. Accordingly, the first settlers in New England called themselves the Christian Israel. Comparison of the Puritan leaders with their great leaders of ancient Israel, especially Moses and Joshua, were common. So the names of Daniel, they named themselves Daniel, Jonathan, Esther, Enoch, Ezra, Rachel, they all took biblical names. And a host of others were in constant use among the Puritans. Interesting enough, there was a conspicuous absence of the names of the Christian saints. Names of cities, towns, and settlements, likewise, it doesn't mean they didn't, will honor them, but they, again, their identity was, again, it made me think, could that Israelite DNA been stirring within them as well? Hallelujah. The names of cities, towns, and settlements likewise derive from Hebraic sources. This widespread use of biblical names, again, we find it all over America, you find biblical names, okay? Even Illinois, Zion, there's a town, Zion. Yeah. The widespread use of biblical names, however, was not confined to the name of offspring, cities, and towns. Names of many biblical heights were eventually bestowed upon the great mountains of America. Mount Carmel and Mount Horeb, home of the prophets, were popular names, such as Mount Nebo, the final resting place of Moses. Names like Mount Ephraim, Mount Gilead, Mount Hermon, Mount Moriah, Mount Pisgah were all popular as well. Some mountains in the New World were called Mount Sinai, Mount Zion, and Mount Olive. Puritan obsession with the Bible led them to try and incorporate many aspects of the Jewish commandments into their lifestyle. So again, they were trying to be Torah observant for as much as they knew. And, of their, and their literal interpretation of Hebraic laws. One of the most significant was the concept of the Sabbath as a day of rest and meditation. 
Puritan Sabbath observance began at sundown, and no work of any kind, even household chores, was allowed for the next 24 hours. Sabbath observance was strictly monitored by local officials. In summary, the majority of the earliest settlers were Puritans from England. Unlike their cousins back home, these American Puritans strongly identified with both the historical traditions and customs of the ancient Hebrews of the Tanakh. They viewed their immigration from England as a virtual reenactment of the Jewish exodus from Egypt. England was Egypt, the English king was Pharaoh, the Atlantic Ocean their Red Sea, and America was the land of Israel, and the Indians were the ancient Canaanites. They were the new Israelites entering into a new covenant with God in the new promised land. Those settlers found themselves in the new world, had no existing laws of government. Their first task, therefore, was to create a legal framework of their communities, and the first place they looked for guidance was the Hebrew Bible. Thus, most of the early legislation of the colonies of New England was determined by Scripture. The most extreme example was the Connecticut Code of 1650, which created a form of fundamentalist government based almost entirely on Jewish law using numerous citations from the Bible. The same held true for the Code of New Haven and many other colonies. Of course, they don't teach this in school. As the first assembly of New Haven in 1639, John Davenport clearly declared the primacy of the Bible as the legal and moral foundation of the colony. Scriptures do hold forth a perfect rule for the direction and government of all men in all duties which they are to perform to God, and men as well in the government of families and commonwealth, as in matters of the church. The word of God shall be the only rule to be attended unto in organizing the affairs of government in this plantation. Thanksgiving, which, was evolved, which evolved into a national day of feasting and celebration, was initially conceived by the pilgrims in 1621 as a similar to the Jewish Sukkot. Oh. The holiday of joy is told in Leviticus 23.40. It was for the Puritans and is for the Jews a great joy because it was a time of the year for the gathering grain and fruits from their fields into their homes, a time for introspection and prayer because it was God, not man, who allowed the first harvest. So again, we see the connection. Again, God, you know, uh, this land has been blessed only because of godly principles. You know, and again, just as Israel... You know, uh, ancient Israel moved away from those godly principles. They lost the blessings. So this country, over the years, has, has little by little, really probably since, even during World War II, there was, there was still a fear of God. It was normal to go to church. It was normal to believe in the Bible. But when we hit, again, after World War II, again, you start seeing little by little, you know, more liberal, liberalism, more, you know, um, a pulling away from from God you know and again you know I pray